Good morning, church. We're so glad you're here uh, joining us in the room and online. Uh, let's sing and let's sing some songs this morning. And Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. Church family, it is always exciting, isn't it, when we get to start off our service with a baptism? Amen. 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 Oh, there we go, there we go, there we go. I want to introduce you to Alex Schaefer. Alex, you want to come on in here and come on down into the water? Alex trusted Christ several years ago and has decided on his own accord to follow Jesus in Believer's Baptism. He shared his testimony with uh, Kariston, our children's ministry uh, director, and uh, we're just so excited today to be able to witness this. I know, Alex, you got a lot of family here and friends, and, and uh, we're excited for that too. I want to share a passage before I baptize him. Again, when I do this, the water is good temperature. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 13, then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. 
And John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me. But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he baptized him. And as when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming and resting on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. In obedience to our Lord's command, and upon your profession of faith, Alex, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You're good. as we kick off our summer with a family picnic. This will take place from 6 to 9 p.m. here at the church. So grab your lawn chairs and your blankets and join us for a fun night. We will have the grill fired up. The church will provide the burgers, hot dogs, and drinks. We ask that you just bring a side and dessert to share. See you there. Join us for our Megas Hobby Camp and Preschool VBS July 16th through the 20th from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. Kids from 1st through 5th grade will get to choose their favorite hobbies class. Ages 4 to kindergarten will get to participate in our awesome VBS. This is free to everyone. Registration opens June 1st at noon. Be sure to register early to make sure your child gets their top choice. Some classes are limited. We've had so many questions about the progress of the Pittsburgh Church plant. So I want to invite you Sunday, June 11th. We're going to have a short informational and interest meeting right after the second service in the worship center. You can come and hear the plans, learn how you can pray for this ministry, and hear about opportunities to partner with it. I hope you'll make plans now to be here for that short meeting on June 11th. Storehouse students and parents were less than a month away from Falls Creek Youth Camp. Be sure to register before this Wednesday to avoid the final price increase. Our next monthly prayer meeting for community revival and spiritual awakening will be held June 1st at the Upper East Room in the Education Building at noon. See you there. FBC Littles, Babies Through Kindergarten, join us for our summer kickoff bash on June 3rd from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. We will have a cookout on the church lawn. We'll provide burgers and hot dogs, bring a side dish, and a dessert to share. We will also be playing some water games. Well, good morning again. Let's all say good morning to Josh Wells, who's filling in for Jason while he's out this morning. Let's give Josh a hand of encouragement. Not only do we appreciate Josh, but we also appreciate our amazing praise team and them continuing to give of their service and their gifts um, week in and week out uh, for the glory of the Lord. Let's give them a hand of encouragement this morning as well. Glad you all are here out on a Memorial Day weekend, and I know it's a weekend where we just kind of pause and reflect and remember uh, the lives of those that were lost in, in service, in military service, so we are so grateful for the sacrifice of so many, and what a picture that is ultimately of the ultimate sacrifice made for us in Jesus Christ, that He died, that we might live as well. You may, you may have seen this morning um, up on the screen I hope you did, about the informational and interest meeting for the church plant, Grace Church in Pittsburgh. Um, I want to encourage you and let you know there are going to be three of those meetings, informational and interest meetings, over the next three months, June, July, and August. And each one of those informational meetings is going to address a different part of the church plant process. The very first one on June 11th, we're going to discuss the question, why? Why? Why plant a church in Pittsburgh? Why is that important to us? Why is that a priority? And what you don't see on that screen is that on June 11th, right after the second service, very short here, we are then going to later that afternoon pack up and go to Pittsburgh and have another informational and interest meeting in Pittsburgh at Lincoln Park um, under pavilion number three. So if any of you are interested in maybe helping us with that process of, of doing a little bit of, of grilling and cooking and ministering, um, in Lincoln Park on June 11th, if you have that Sunday afternoon, about 5 o'clock, 4 o'clock, if you have that open and would like to be a part of that, come and talk to me, um, that we would definitely be able to have a place for you. I was, 
By the way, if you are coming to this interest and information meeting, that does not mean you're signed up and we're packing you to Pittsburgh, okay? Um, Coming to the informational and interest meeting really is just that. You get to learn about the plan, you get to learn how you can pray, and you get to hear about opportunities that you can participate in that ministry. So that's all that is. There's not a hard sell. We're not signing you up on anything. It's just for you to be able to gather that information for those different reasons. One of the things I want to say this morning, and it kind of struck me, um, really I didn't have it planned on my, on my notes, on my stuff to share with you this morning. But we walked in, I looked over Planning Center, which is the software that we use to keep ourselves organized as a praise team. It has a whole order of service in it. And I know that we, had back, we were back in our prayer room this morning before the first service, and the praise team and I were going through the service and going through each of the lines and talking about what was going to happen. And I don't know if this is you, but if it is, I know it's so easy for us sometimes to because we do things with a certain structure, with a certain order, uh, we try to do everything decently and in order, I think it can become very easy for us to think, okay, this is the next thing that's going to happen, and then the next thing that's going to happen, and then there's another song, and then the preacher's going to preach, and then the preacher's going to say this, and then we're going to stand up. It can become so easy for us in a very short amount of time to fall into a routine, and not that routines are bad. But I hope this morning that in the midst of our routine, that maybe right where we are sitting right now, maybe right where I'm standing, we may be able to just kind of pause and reframe our mind for a minute. And we may be able, in our prayer time, in just a moment, that we might be able to say, God, I know that there are certain things we're going to go through this morning. But that we might say, God, in the midst of this routine, I need you to speak to me. That we might say to, from our heart to God, God, it's not about the words on the screen if they're not really the words of my heart. God, we're going to open up your word. In just a little bit, we're going to open up the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of God. And we're going to get to hear what God has to say. And I hope that the preaching, I hope that the songs, I hope that the songs set are not just one more thing on that list that we're getting through. So I pray that we would engage or re-engage again in worship. I am thankful for order. I am thankful for structure. But I pray that it never becomes a distraction to having a real encounter with God in worship and in the Word and in serving Him. Many of you already know this morning that, that we welcome our guests. That's the next thing on the list. If you are our guest, we're glad you're here. There's a lot of special things that are happening here at First Baptist, and we're glad that you would come and be a part of that. If you're checking things out, you have some questions, please feel free to ask me. Anybody that has a lanyard around their neck, any one of our praise team, uh, we will all be willing to share with you some of the great things that are going on, help point you in the right direction, answer any questions you have. For those of you that want to give this morning, we have several ways that we give. We give during our worship set. Uh, You see the plates along the front. There's a black box back at the back. And we just pray that you would have a cheerful heart of worship as you give this morning. First Baptist, it is a joy to be your pastor, and I'm excited to be able to be in here with you this morning, sharing out of Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42, the conflict that arose at one of Jesus' meals. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, verse 38 through 42. Will you pause with me for just a moment as we pray? God, I'm always grateful for the people that come into this place on the Lord's Day. And I'm reminded that this isn't just your hour. This is your day. This is the day where we set aside to celebrate and remember the resurrection of Jesus and what that means for us and the joy and the purpose and the power that that brings to the life of your followers and how that truth that Jesus was raised from the dead transformed the followers of Jesus and has ever since. And I'm grateful, Lord, that your sacrifice was accepted by your Father and shown in the fact that you rose incorruptible from the grave. And I pray this morning, Lord, that you would shake us. If we are in a routine that has distracted us from being able to hear from you, I pray that for these next few moments, God, we would ask you to change our heart. Help us to see what we need to see and hear what we need to hear Help us to sing as though people whose lives have been changed. 
that we would sing as the redeemed. Father, I thank you for each person here and all the volunteers, the many volunteers that it takes for this service to happen. I'm grateful, Lord, that we worship a God who is worthy of serving and worthy of our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Continue to worship. Come now, fount of every blessing, to my heart to sing thy grace. And streams of mercy never ceasing call for songs of loudest praise. And teach me some melody. Sung by flaming tongues above and Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it The mount of thy redeeming love Here I raise my Ebenezer Hither by thy help I'm come And I Here's my heart, Lord. 
claims that I'm Church, you can be seated. Rarely does the Bible record Jesus enjoying a meal peacefully. His words, his actions, the guests, the topics, even the questions often resulted in conflict. And if you think your table gets crazy, just hold on. This next section is full of tension and grace. Luke chapter 10. We're coming into a section of Luke's gospel that records meals that aren't recorded anywhere else. They're exclusive to Luke's content. And that's kind of cool because last week we saw the one miracle that was recorded in all four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and what a rare feat that is. And now we jump back to some exclusive uh, content that is only found in Luke's Gospel. You heard me say on the bumper video that rarely did Jesus ever eat a meal in peace. It's recorded that oftentimes at the meals he was at, um, there was conflict. Now, of course, you know, when you're teaching and you're writing the Gospels, you're going to record the things that were said. So much of the conflict was used, inspired by the Spirit, to be recorded, obviously, for our good and our instruction and our Christology, learning more about Him. But how many of you as parents can relate to that? Not many of the meals you've eaten were eaten in peace. I wasn't going to share this, but I will share it because I think it, I think it, it illustrates a point. Bree and I, for a while back, we tried to um, bring some order to the family table. And we would write out some rules for the table at our home. And I think that there's some spiritual application to this that you know, we're writing this out so that, you know, if there's an issue, we can be like, oh, we don't do that at the table. You know, point to, you know, violation number 18. <laughs> violation number 43. You know, we could point to all 87 of them that we had up on the wall. <laughs> Ironically, we kept that in the, in the dining room so when we would eat, you know, we would all be able to see them. Well, what we thought was really going to help be able to, you know, teach some some table manners and teach some lessons and courtesy actually became a race to see who could break all of them at one meal. So we ended up over time having to take down the list. But Jesus rarely ever ate a meal. In fact, we're going to find very few instances where Jesus sat down and ate a meal at peace. Very few times. I'll give you a hint the few times that Jesus did eat the meals was after His resurrection. Those were peaceful. Those were joyful. When you go back and look at these last weeks, this is the fourth week in this series of table looking at the mission, ministry, and message of Jesus as He used meals as a ministry. We we noticed that the very first one, there was a problem at the meal because there was a tax collector convention when Jesus called Matthew, and Matthew has his party, and all the tax collectors are there. So even if you have just a basic understanding of the New Testament, you can see that there are a whole bunch of tax collectors at a dinner, and there's a religious establishment with Jesus in the middle. You can kind of see how those are going to butt heads. We go to the second week, and we see that as Jesus is in the house of a Pharisee, 
named Simon, there is a sinful woman in town who comes to show her gratitude for the forgiveness of sins that she's received. And she's worshiping him in this house. So on one hand, you have this sinful woman who we believe to be a prostitute. And on the other hand, you have Simon the Pharisee, his house. So we can see how this conflict is going to arise. Last week, you saw the issue, the challenge that came up when there were more people showing up than groceries. So the disciples think there's a problem. And Jesus obviously takes care of the problem by multiplying the loaves and fish. But there's always something going on. And even though in the first two messages and several hereafter, we're going to be able to see, okay, I see where this conflict is coming, this is a unique scenario. The situation we're looking at this morning in chapter 10, verse 38 through 42, is unique. Because before, we saw two groups of people on two very separate ends of a moral spectrum. And we could see how that was going to happen. But this morning, this seems to be an unexpected conflict. Only found in Luke's Gospel. And it's not a conflict of two different groups of people on two totally different ends of a moral spectrum. Not this morning. This morning we have conflict arising from two very faithful followers of Jesus. Here's the truth. Church family. Faithful followers of Jesus can still have conflict among one another. And we're going to see that this morning. We're going to see where this conflict came, how Jesus addressed it. I want you to join me as we read together God's Word, chapter 10, verse 38. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village. We believe this village to be Bethany. And a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving. And she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which shall not be taken away from her. I'm sure many of you have heard this, mess, or heard this text preached or read, read it over before, or read a devotional about it. And one of the things you're going to find in many devotionals and oftentimes commentary about this is as followers of Christ, when we read incidences, especially in the Gospels, it seems as though there's a very clear right and a very clear wrong. There's the way we should act and the way we shouldn't act. There's black and white, it seems, and often many of the teachings of Jesus. But this one, you may be tempted to look at it and say, okay, well, one of these women is right and the other one is wrong. We have this tendency to break it into terms like that. But I hope this morning that this, our time together in, in really diving into what Jesus was saying and what Jesus was addressing, you may find that this is not necessarily an either or, but a both and type of a scenario. But look at the conflict. The two people, the two people outside of Jesus that make up this story are Martha and Mary. And the story goes this way, that as Jesus is passing through, he comes to what we believe to be the town of Bethany where Mary, Martha, and their brother Lazarus live. You've heard that name before. If you haven't, read John 11. You'll learn a little bit more about him. But here Jesus is passing through. He's on his way. And Martha would have heard that Jesus was in town. And she runs and finds him, we believe, and says, Master, I want you to come and rest and relax at my house. I will provide a meal. It'll be great. We want you to be our guest at the home. So Jesus and we believe probably the disciples are with him. They go into Mary and Martha's home. And there, Martha is providing this dinner for Jesus. And in the story, what you see is that Mary is not a part of this plan. She is not a part of preparing, of serving, uh, maybe not even cleaning up. We don't know exactly all the stage that Martha's in at this point. But I want you to consider something for just a moment. If, if you came in here this morning expecting to be able to hear that one of them is right and one of them is wrong, I want you to consider Mary for just a moment. 
Mary, the one who's sitting at Jesus' feet, believes He is who He is, is a faithful follower of Jesus, and she values Jesus and His words. That phrase, sitting at His feet, may sound a little archaic to us, but what that means is that Jesus was in a position of teaching. He was in a position as a rabbi of authoritative teaching, and Mary had taken the place of a disciple. Now, that was not common for women to sit at the feet of Jesus. And that's why this is recorded in Luke's Gospel. She is sitting in a place uh, as a student learning. Now again, uncommon, not forbidden. Not forbidden anywhere in Scripture, but it was uncommon in society of the day. But you have her, and we can see her in our mind, hearing Jesus teaching as He's going through all of these kingdom principles, and we can see her sitting at His feet, just soaking up the words He's saying. She values Him, and she values His words. She believes. Now Martha, on the other hand, has invited Jesus to come to the house. She too believes. She is a faithful follower. And out of a place, I believe, of honor and respect and love, Martha wants to provide a great meal for the great teacher. I really believe and have no reason to doubt at all that everything Martha was doing in serving this meal came from a place of love and honor and respect to Jesus. Now, if you take these two women, Mary and Martha, they are both, I believe, demonstrating honor and respect to who Jesus is. They're just doing it in two different ways. Now, even though there was, even though I do believe this came from a place of honor and respect for Jesus, I want you to notice something. It does not seem to stay in that lane. Because as Martha is, is flitting around the house, uh, you know, getting everything cooked and baked, you know, the biscuits are about to burn and, and the meat, my goodness, you know, my mom was a, an amazing cook. My mom was a lot like Martha. My mom would cook and she would work hard on it. And you know what? That food was always amazing. But by the time it was set out on the table, she would have you convinced that that was the worst meal you were ever going to eat. Maybe some of you can relate to that. She was so worried and so concerned about getting everything and getting everything just right. And that too came from a place of love and honor. And here Martha is running around the, the house. She's getting everything just right. And, and I'm sure Martha probably had in her mind that Mary was going to help. But she's not. Can you imagine Martha? She's hustling around and she looks in there and she catches Mary sitting down at his feet listening. Can you imagine as this goes on a little bit, she thinks Mary's going to get up and help, but Mary doesn't get up and help? She sees Mary just kicking back, taking it all in. Can you imagine Martha running into the kitchen, banging some pans around, clanging them? Can you imagine her coming around the corner and shooting Mary glares that Mary probably never sees because she's focused on Jesus? Can you feel the tension rising? I know I have heard many women say yes. I heard some just now. Uh-huh. It's crazy. I, I get to hear, you get to hear me. I get to hear some of you. Uh-huh. I'm sure there are a few ladies that are elbowing their husbands as well. Come on, Mary. Help me out a little bit. What happens? What started, I believe, is a good place, a good thing, quickly turned into something problematic. You see, the way the problem came about but I want you to see number two, the way the problem took over. It turns into a place where Mary seems to resent her sister. Very upset with Mary. I'm in here working. I'm in here laboring. I'm in here doing all this for Jesus. And she's sitting there doing nothing. That's how Martha would have seen this. In fact, we don't even have to assume that. That's what she says. She comes in. Think about this for a moment. She comes in 
while the Son of God is teaching. Okay? She literally walks in as this master rabbi who she respects and believes is the Son of God, the Messiah. She interrupts Him. She literally interrupted the Son of God. Why? My sister's not helping. Jesus, will you do something about it? Look at this for a moment. The way the problem took over. She is not just frustrated. If you think that this is going to stop, it's not. It is fomenting. It is bubbling up. She is getting angrier and angrier and angrier because she doesn't understand something. She doesn't understand why Mary's sitting there and not helping her, and she doesn't now understand why Jesus isn't stopping it. So when it boils to the point that she's going to interrupt this teaching on the kingdom principles, she comes over and she says this, do you not care? She says that to Jesus. Do you not care that my sister is sitting there doing absolutely nothing while I'm working my tail off for you? Can you sense a little bit of pride in Martha? We can do that sometimes, can't we? We can become so proud of the way that we serve. We don't understand the way others are not serving and not helping out. And, and if we're not careful, we can have this very judgmental attitude that, that our area of service is greater than everybody else's. You see, here's the thing that Jesus seems to dwell down on, drill down on, and that's this, is that Martha thought her active service for Jesus was more important than Mary's passive service for Jesus. She didn't understand it. So she interrupts the whole thing. Do you not care? I'm over here working. Look at me, Jesus. And she's sitting there doing nothing. Have you heard that question before? Do you not care? Because it has popped up once before in the Gospels. Very similar situation. There was a storm brewing. There was a storm brewing in this house. The other time it's mentioned, the question was asked of Jesus, do you not care? There was a storm brewing on the Sea of Galilee. You may recall that the disciples were in the boat and Jesus is with them, but Jesus is sleeping. And as they're going across the Sea of Galilee, a great storm comes up on the sea and the boat is tossed and they're afraid they're going to sink. They're not just afraid they're going to lose the boat, they're afraid they're going to lose their lives. And you remember they come over and they wake Jesus up and the very first thing they tell him is, Master, do you not care that we're perishing? They called into question the character of Jesus and His loving concern for them. They were so worked up, rightfully so, in a storm. I think if we were in that situation, we probably would have acted similarly. And they, they're so scared they're going to die that they wake Jesus up and say, Do you not care? And here Martha so upset that Mary is not helping out. She wants everything to be just perfect and just great for this master teacher. What started as an act, I believe, that was planted in the soil of honor and reverence is now starting to grow weeds because she's harassing. She's frustrated. She's resenting her sister. She's harsh with others. She's interrupting Jesus. She's calling into question something about his character. Do you not care, Jesus? I want you to see the way Jesus addressed the issue. Number three. So, Luke, Matthew of the Gospel writers, of the four Gospel writers, Matthew and John were eyewitnesses. They recorded what they saw as the Spirit would inspire them and brought to remembrance. Mark, we believe, got most of his material from an eyewitness, Peter. Luke, we believe, got many eyewitnesses. Did a lot of research, investigative reporting as he was compiling this story of the good news of Jesus and the resurrection, and then later, volume 2, the book of Acts, the history of the early church and the work of the apostles. 
But I want you to think in light of that truth, that Matthew and John were eyewitnesses, Mark would have gotten his information from Peter, and Luke is getting it from a, a varied source of dependable, reliable, validated sources. I want you to think about what Jesus says and how it's recorded. Because Luke was not in that room when this took place. But whoever it was that told, G, told Luke what happened that day, Luke records it. And how is it recorded? Look at how Jesus responds. Martha, Martha. Whoever it was in that room, whether it was Martha, maybe it was Mary, maybe it was one of the disciples, when they are relating this story to, to Luke, they would have said that Jesus turned to Martha and said, Martha, Martha. Church family, I don't want to put an emphasis where something isn't emphasized. But just reading those two names put together, can you hear the tenderness with which Jesus replies to Martha? Can you hear it? Can you, can you feel the gentleness of Jesus? I just want to pause for a minute. I really think that this might be a healing salve for some. I think if we're not careful, we can believe the lies of the enemy, that God is angry at us as His children, that God is continually, perpetually disappointed and upset. Some of us may believe the lie of the enemy, that God is just around that next storm cloud, just waiting till we get out from under, out away from the good people, just enough to strike us with a lightning bolt. You don't know how many times I've talked to people about the church or a church or coming to church, and they would say, oh, pastor, you say you got a new building. Well, I wouldn't want it to crumble when I come walking in. You ever heard that before? If so, we'll just hand out hard hats at the door. I think there are a lot of people that do that, that we believe that lie. That as a child of God, God is somehow perpetually disappointed in us. Listen to me. You and I could no more disappoint God. Disappointment would indicate some kind of a surprise on God's part. God is not surprised with your failures. God is not surprised by your sin. God is not surprised by your fall or my fall. Nothing I could ever do would surprise God. It is not biblical for us as children of God, to think that God is sitting up on a cloud somewhere with His arms crossed, shooting glares down at us because of something we just did. God loves His children. The magnitude and the breadth and the depth of God's love for His children is so immense. It is a love that is by far greater than any earthly father could ever show their earthly child. You and I can only speak of it and believe it while not fully understanding it or appreciating it this side of heaven. We cannot fathom the depth of the love of God and how He feels for us. And here, Martha comes in, interrupts this teaching with this silly complaint. And I'm going to call it that, a silly complaint. She's not helping and I'm doing all the work. She interrupted kingdom teaching by the Son of God to do that. And what does Jesus do? Martha, Martha. He is tender. He is gentle. One of the prophecies concerning Christ was that a bruised reed shall he not break and smoking flax he shall not quench. He is gentle and he is tender with his children. Now before we go much further, let me say we must be careful to not err on the other side of that either. Because Jesus can still be tender and gentle and still rebuke, still correct. God still disciplines His children because He loves us. He is not angry with His arms crossed. He is a loving, disciplined Father that knows what is best for us and is going to teach us that in the school of faith. So we have to be able to have a balanced approach. God is gentle, Jesus is tender with His children because He loves them, but He also will correct, reprove, instruct, and discipline. And we see this demonstrated in the Scripture. Jesus strikes the perfect balance. Martha, 
Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. What's Martha's concern? Why does she interrupt this teaching of the master teacher, the Son of God? I'm working and she's not, Jesus. Make her do something. What does Jesus do? He does not address that issue. Jesus does not say, Martha, you're right. You've been working really hard. He doesn't turn to Mary and say, Mary, your sister's kind of got a point. You know what Jesus does? With tenderness. Martha, Martha. The issue is not that you're serving. The issue is your heart. That's what Jesus drills down on. He does not allow this to stick to the peripheral issue of work. He goes to the very heart of the issue, and He still does that. He still deals with the heart of the issue. What does He say to her? You are anxious and troubled about many things. His issue with her is not that she's serving. It's that she's serving too much. That she's doing so much that it's causing her from a place of pride and anger and resentment to look down on other people. And Jesus addresses that. You're anxious about many things. You are troubled, Martha. And then Jesus says something that a lot of people believe some different things about what Jesus was trying to say. Notice in verse 42, but one thing is necessary. Or a few things are necessary, your Scripture may say. Martha, you remember, this is, a, this is a teaching moment. You're troubled and anxious about many things, but there's one thing that's necessary. And if you were to read a lot of different theologians, a lot of different commentaries, you would find that there are two major interpretations of what most believe Jesus was saying or trying to communicate here. And I don't know which one was necessarily what he was trying to say or both, but I'm going to share both of those with you. One of those is that when Jesus is saying one thing is necessary, what he's saying, some believe, is that I'm here in your house, I'm an invited guest, and I came here and I am teaching. I am in the place of teaching as an authoritarian, as a, as a person of authority, a rabbi. I'm teaching as the Son of God these kingdom principles. And the one thing that is needful, the one thing that is important, the one thing that should be overall is that if I'm teaching, you should be listening. That's what some will believe. That's how some interpret that. The one thing that is needful, you should be listening to the words that I'm saying. Some other people believe a second thing. That when Jesus was saying one thing is needful, it would be the equivalent of saying, Martha, Martha, a sandwich would do. Cut up some cheese. Bring out a charcuterie board. Martha. It almost seems as though what Jesus is saying is, Martha, you know, I'm here. It's important that you would be listening to the teachings. But, you know, if you want to serve, you don't have to go to all of this trouble. You're so worried. You're so worked up. You see, it's possible that Martha could have come out and served on a smaller scale for the purpose of being able to sit at the feet of Jesus. Let's be honest. If she only had one sandwich, I'm pretty sure Jesus could have made a few more based off of what we've learned just previously, right? No, shortage of food's no big deal for him. Martha, you're anxious. You're troubled. Oh, how often, how often when we're going to have somebody over, we go to all the work, right? Extra work. Why do we do it? Two reasons, I guess. One is we want the people to know they're special. The second reason? We want people to think we're special. I don't want people to see a dirty toilet. What will they think about me? Right? How many of you all clean your house before the house cleaner comes? Tell me why that makes sense. We do it though, don't we? One thing is needful. You see, here's the crux of the issue. 
coming from a place that started out, I believe, good. Martha was so wrapped up in serving Jesus, she wasn't stopping to listen. She wasn't taking advantage of that opportunity to, like her sister, sit at the feet of Jesus. You know what can happen to us today? We can become so busy serving and doing that we don't take time to sit and listen. I know many of you, if not all of you, know this. But in light of this story, I think this bears repeating. You and I hold in our hands this morning the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. You and I are not bound by proximity and placement as they were 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, if you wanted to hear Jesus, you had to go and find Jesus. Here, Mary and Martha, have Him over their house. That should have been the utmost importance. You know what? Jesus is here. He is the priority over all of the priorities. I'm going to feed Him because I want to take care of Him, and I'm going to provide a meal. It may not be as big as I normally would, but I want to serve something, and I want to get in there, and I want to sit down, and I want to spend time with Jesus. And you and I have, thankfully, we don't have to wait in line. We don't have to wait till He leaves their house to talk to Him on the road. In a very real sense, friends, you and I have the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God, and any time we want, we can open it up and read the words of Jesus. And thankfully, it is not just about our reading. God placed within the lives to literally dwell inside of every born-again believer His Holy Spirit that will guide us into all truth. So right now, as a child of God, I have the Word of God in front of me and the Spirit of God inside of me. And that is a tremendous blessing. In fact, I can truly think of no greater blessing than having the Word of God in front of me and the Spirit of God inside of me while I wait to be with Jesus. Can you think of anything better than that? And here you and I have this. We have at any moment, any time we want, we can sit at the feet of Jesus. We can fellowship. We can read. We can listen. We can worship. We're not bound by place, proximity, and time in the sense that they were. You and I can literally feast on the Word. But what do we find ourselves doing? Oftentimes we find ourselves doing and going and serving and not sitting and listening, and fellowshipping, and worshiping. Mary, Jesus does not just address Martha. He turns to Mary, and He says this, Mary has chosen the good part. He's not telling, I I get no indication he's telling Martha she shouldn't have served. She served too much, and it bothered her. He addresses that. But then he turns to Mary, and he says this, it will not be taken from her. Last week, we saw the table spread in the wilderness. We saw Jesus making a meal where there wasn't enough. And I hope we never forget, not just the miracle, but who Jesus performed the miracle for. They were people who saw Him get into a boat. They believed He was who He said He was. And they had an idea where He was going. And they, on foot, go around the Sea of Galilee while He's on a boat, and they meet Him on the other side. Why were they there? Did they go there to get the food? No, not that time. The Bible says they went there because they wanted to hear the kingdom and they wanted their sick to be healed. They went there to a place where there was nothing else but Jesus. And He fed them. 
Do you remember when the disciples came and said, Master, the day is far spent. These people have got to be hungry. Send them away that they may find food. Do you remember what Jesus said? They do not need to go away. He said, I'm not going to send them away. What does he say to Mary, who's sitting there at the feet of Jesus? Martha, her own sister, is attacking her. What, is, what does he say? I'm not sending her away. She found the good part. Mary was commended and defended. Jesus was gentle, not just to Mary, who was there, placing him as a priority over all others. He was gentle to Martha, who didn't understand, and he addressed the direct issue that was affecting her heart. And church family, I want to tell you, I want to ask you, I want to bring this down to a very simple point. Do you have, as a part of your regular rhythm with Jesus, do you have a regular time that you set aside to sit at the feet of Jesus? A systematic, intentional time that you open the Scriptures and you read. I am thankful for the many people that serve and that do. But I'm also thankful for those that get up maybe a little early in the morning, maybe stay up a little extra at night, maybe over their lunch break, they pull out their pocket New Testament and they sit down and they read just a section of the Scriptures. They sit at the feet of Jesus. There is no substitute to sitting at the feet of Jesus in the development of His people. How silly for us to think that we can become more like Jesus while not being with Jesus. And if that's you and you've, you don't have that regular routine, I want to ask you this morning, I want to tell you that you will not do anything. There will be nothing as meaningful, there will be nothing as potentially rewarding as setting aside some time as a regular part of your rhythm to choose the good part, to open up the scriptures that God has so graciously given to us, to read, to listen, to apply, to worship. And I'm going to invite you. Jesus said that well, there's one thing that's needful. What is that one thing for you? Is it to set aside a regular part of your spiritual journey, your rhythm, to read and to worship privately? Is it you've never trusted Christ? Maybe you've never been saved. You've never trusted Him to be your Lord and Savior. You've come to church. You've been to church. You've read some of the Bible, but you've never trusted Christ. Never had that moment in your life where you would say you've been born again. I'm going to invite you to come at our response time. Maybe you're serving in so many ways that you haven't paused to sit at the feet of Jesus. Father, this morning, in light of this, I pray that you would press on our hearts through the work of your Holy Spirit what that one thing that is needful is. Mary was troubled over many things, but you brought it down to one thing. This morning, Father, I believe it all comes down to our relationship with you. Help us, Father, with fresh eyes to evaluate and have our walk with you evaluated. And today, if we are found lacking, if we have been doing but not sitting, if we have been active but not passive, bring us to the place where we are committed to sitting at the feet of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together. Lord, I come and I confess bowing here I find my rest Without you I fall apart You're the one That guides my heart Lord, I need you Oh, I need you Every Defense, my right.
righteousness Oh God, how I need you Where sin runs deep Your grace is more Where grace is found Is where you are And where you are Come on up here. I want you to get a good look at this young man's face so you can continue to pray for him. Amen. Give him a hand of encouragement. There you go, Alex. You can go ahead and return to your seat. And I'm going to turn it back over to you, Josh, for one final song. Awesome. It's been a pleasure worship, worshiping with you guys this morning. Let's sing one more. Say 
are dismissed. Have a happy Memorial Day. Hey, thanks so much for listening to our podcast at First Baptist Joplin. If you are interested in coming and worshiping with us live, we would love for you to come at 9 and 1030 on Sunday mornings. 